Hello a and P1 students. This lecture covers connective tissues, um, our last category of tissue types in our study of histology. I wanted to show you right away some connective tissues so that you can see how diverse they are. The image in the upper left is called loose connective tissue. It's found underneath the skin, surrounding many organs actually. And the image on the right is blood. Now they are both connective tissues. So at first glance, you'll notice they, they don't seem to have too much in common, right? But there's one key characteristic that they share with all other connective tissues. And that is that the cells reside in an extensive extracellular matrix. Either that matrix is a fluid or a solid but the cells usually make the matrix and then they live in it. So let's look at our uh, loose connective tissue again up on the left. The cells are called fibroblasts and they're shown here as dark purple stains or circles. And they're existing in a somewhat gelatinous matrix with protein fibers running through the matrix. Now the blood also has cells living in a matrix. The light pink ones are red blood cells and the bigger purple ones are white blood cells or leukocytes and they live in plasma which of course is a liquid matrix. So the characteristics of connective tissue include that they're very widespread throughout the body in axial structures as well as appendicular structures and they're all made up of two components a cellular component meaning a cell type of some sort and a matrix that the cell lives in sometimes instead of seeing cellular component you'll see the term formed elements that's just because there's a certain type of pseudocell in blood called a platelet. It's a formed element, but it's not a true cell. Anyhow, so there's a cellular component and a matrix component in all connective tissues. Now, this matrix is, exists in between cells. As I mentioned, it can be a liquid or a solid. In bone and in cartilage we call that matrix ground substance and sometimes we'll see protein fibers in the matrix so just some things to watch out for <clears throat> so connective tissues are the most abundant and widespread type of tissue in the body they're also the most structurally diverse tissue types in the body so it's one category, but there's a hodgepodge of things in the category. As you can see from this slide, I've got nine pictures of nine different types of tissue. And in some cases, you can make out cells pretty easily. Like on the lower left, there's a cell. On the lower right, there's a cell. Of course, we did blood already, and we've done loose connective tissue. This is adipose tissue. And this whole white circle is a cell. In bone tissue, just the tiny little black dots that almost resemble spiders are cells. So they all have cells that are sitting in a matrix. And some of these um, are what we call connective tissue proper. More widespread and less specialized. That's what the top three are. Okay, the top three are connective tissue proper, propers, <laughs> connective tissues proper, and the bottom six are specialized connective tissues. So we're going to look at those um, in order of the proper connective tissues first, and then we're going to look at the specialized connective tissues. So the names of the proper connective tissues include 
loose connective tissue. I just put CT to abbreviate it. Some people insist on calling it areolar, but that just describes where it's come from, coming from the nipple area. Its proper name is loose connective tissue. And then there's dense connective tissue of two types, regular and irregular. So those are that's where we're going to start. But the other category, specialized connective tissues, include adipose bone, blood, and cartilage. And we'll do those last. So first, let's look at proper connective tissues, loose, dense, regular, and dense, irregular. In all cases, the cells are fibroblasts. And these cells are making fibers that are located in the matrix. So I'm going to circle in yellow the cells in each of the three types of connective tissue proper. In loose, we've already seen these dark circles are fibroblasts. In dense connective tissue, dense regular, they're kind of flattened out, but they're still dark purple stains. And in dense irregular, albeit this is a little bit lower magnification, they're again more circular. So those are the cells. Now, where are these things located? In all cases, you'll find them, uh, I'm sorry, in all types, you'll find them located underneath the surface of the skin, in the dermis of the skin or under the epithelium. In the case of loose connective tissue, you'll find it kind of um, adhering organs together. So inside the body you have multiple organs and it's important that those organs stay in position. And loose connective tissue surrounds the organs and the blood vessels and the nerves, kind of keeping everything together, allowing movement but not allowing too much movement. Dense connective tissue, regular connective, sorry, dense regular connective tissue is very strong and it's found in tendons and ligaments. Dense irregular is also strong, but it's usually not found in linear structures. Tendons and ligaments are very linear. They're connecting muscle and bone or bone and bone, which I'll go over again. Dense irregular will be surrounding an organ um, like forming a joint capsule around a joint to keep the ends of the bones kind of isolated or the meninges. That's kind of a round membrane made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So again, here's loose connective tissue with the fibroblast secreting fibers. Now we need to talk about the different types of fibers found in each of these connective tissues, uh, proper connective tissues. In loose connective tissue, there's two kinds of fibers. There's collagen fibers and there's elastic fibers. And it's the elastic fibers that are thin and darkly stained. And when this loose connective tissue is stretched, the elastic fiber allows it to recoil and retain its shape. The collagen fiber gives strength. Now, dense connective tissue. The fibers are located, uh, are sorry, are very dense as the name would imply, and there's not much space in between the fibers. So here's a fibroblast, or I have one circle pointed to over here, and then the fibers are so abundant that there's very little space in between them. I see a little space right here, but generally speaking, they're packed in tight and they're just collagen fibers providing strength. 
Now, one thing I wanted to mention, since I've said that dense regular connective tissue is found in tendons and ligaments, I thought I'd mention to you what the difference is between a tendon and a ligament. A tendon connects a muscle to the bone. So our skeletal muscles that we can consciously control when we contract, our bones move, they're attached by tendons. Ligaments connect bone to bone. So they help keep joints in place. For example, the humerus and the ulna form a joint together and there are ligaments that help keep them together. So that's what dense regular connective tissue is all about. Now dense irregular connective tissue is similar in composition to dense regular and that is that there's still fibroblasts that secrete collagen fibers that are very strong. The difference is the arrangement of the fibers. The fibers are a little bit looser and they're kind of swirly, right? They're not um, linear and tightly organized. So um, these are uh, this tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, is usually forming um, a covering over an organ. Like over the kidney we have a renal capsule. Around joints we have a capsule. The meninges I mentioned before. You will see um, dense irregular connective tissue when we look at the skin in our next chapter. And when we look at the skin, the skin is so thick, it has many layers. We're going to be looking at low magnification like this picture down at the bottom. And this is what our dense irregular connective tissue will look like. Notice the swirly collagen fibers in there. Okay, so that's dense irregular. I've been showing you very high magnification in both regular dense connective tissue and irregular. That is all for our connective tissue proper. So in review, we have loose connective tissue with a lot of space in between cells and fibers. We have dense regular connective tissue with collagen fibers that are densely packed. We have dense irregular where there's still collagen fibers that are somewhat dense, but they're not aligned um, in an organized manner, at least visually. Okay, let's go to the specialized connective tissues now. <clears throat> the specialized connective tissues include adipose, bone, blood, and cartilages. I'm going to wait on the cartilages. Okay, that's why they look black and white. We're just going to wait on those. So we're going to start with these first three, adipose, bone, and blood. Okay, so adipose, sometimes people put it into connective tissue proper because it is so widespread. Like loose connective tissue surrounding organs, you will find adipose surrounding almost every organ as well. Um, I've chosen, and other people do too, chosen to put it into specialized connective tissue due to one of its functions. And one of its functions that's highly specialized is that it stores lipid. The lipid is in a vacuole that makes the cell look clear. So that's why the cells look white. So we find adipose tissue underneath the skin in subcutaneous fat and internally around organs. And the main functions of adipose you would think would be this energy storage. But really it provides three other things that are 
equally, if not more important. One is insulation. The subcutaneous fat insulates us from changes in environmental temperature, so it helps maintain our body temperature. It also cushions internal organs. So, um, for example, there are locations internally where uh, you don't want pressure, like on the bladder, for example, um, and adipose can cushion that as we move. It also helps maintain the position of organs. Uh, kidneys in particular are up against the back of the body wall, and there's a bunch of adipose kind of coating the outside edges to make that smooth back there um, to keep the kidneys in place. So adipose tissue is important for more than just lipid storage. The structure of adipose tissue doesn't fit our cell and matrix um, construct very well. The cells are pretty close together. There may be here and there some in extracellular material because there's blood vessels that run through there as well. Um, so it, it doesn't fit quite as easily. It, it does fit, but it's not as obvious. These cells are called adipocytes. It's kind of a funny name, adipocytes. And they look empty because there's a vacuole inside the adipocyte, shown in yellow here, that contains lipid, usually triglycerides, but it could be other lipids. In fact, the vacuole can be so full that it pushes the nucleus up against the cell membrane. So that's adipose tissue, recognizable by these empty-looking cells. Now, bone tissue is quite different. <clears throat> I guess it's no surprise where bone tissue is found. That would be in bones, right? And the function of bone is to support or protect other organs. I guess it supports our entire body, giving us a framework for which our muscles can move against, but it also protects organs like the heart and the lungs. It can store calcium and other minerals that are important like phosphate, things like that. It can also store adipose. So you find adipose tissue in adult long bones, which we will talk about later in the semester. Now for the connective tissue cell versus matrix um, scheme. The cells are called osteocytes. The matrix we just call matrix and it that's where the minerals are stored. Okay. Now this picture is very low magnification, very, very low magnification. So the cells are very tiny. And they're so tiny that I don't even know if I can circle one for you. They look like spiders, if I look up close, which we will in a little bit. There's one cell. And that cell has made the matrix that it's sitting in. And now it's trapped. It's stuck there. But it does send out extensions cytoplasmic extensions to other cells. So there is some communication. But you can see that there's this repetitive structure that looks a little bit like the rings on a tree trunk, right? We're going to talk about what those are in just a little bit. Now, bone tissue forms in two different ways. So we say there's two types of bone. It's still all bone tissue. It's just that the tissue... Uh, forms another level of structure. It's not just flat. Okay, so the two types are called spongy bone and compact bone. And spongy bone forms this lattice work structure. Osteocytes still make a matrix. It's just interesting how there's space in different locations inside of the bone. And if you look 
the head of the femur, even the neck of the femur, the greater trochanter, all the way to about here, you'll have spongy bone. But the shaft the and the outside edge, I guess, of the femur is very strong, and it is made of compact bone. And if you were to look at its surface, it would look like this bottom picture. And that's more or less what we saw in the previous picture. If I were to look at the spongy bone under the microscope, you would also be able to see remnants of this kind of, I guess, tree trunk ring structure, just not as complete. So we'll look at some examples here. All right, so this repetitive unit that we see under the microscope is called an osteon. And you can tell the middle of an osteon by this very dark um, circle in the middle. Someone discovered it a long time ago. I think his name was related to this term, haversion system. So, um, Sometimes an osteon is called a, an herversion system. We're just going to stick with osteon. It's easier to spell anyway. So let's look at what an osteon is made up of. An osteon, shown as A in the diagram, <clears throat> has a central canal in it. That's what was dark before. And in the central canal is an artery, a vein, and a nerve. So that's why it hurts so much when you break a bone. You're actually impinging, impinging on nerves and you're going to have bleeding as well. Now around that central canal are layers of bone matrix. And each layer is called a lamella. So for example, C marks one lamella. And on each edge of the lamella is where you'll find osteocytes. And the osteocytes aren't very apparent in this picture. You can kind of see one here and here. So we have an inset to show you what an osteocyte looks like at the edge of one of these lamella. It sits in a space called a lacuna. So E is the lacuna. And the cell, the osteocyte, is D. Okay, so that's the cell. It's not the nucleus, but it's the cell. What's interesting is that the lamella, the space, has little canals that can tr that reach over to the next lamella. That's why you're seeing some kind of thread-like lines between lamella. Those are little canals called canaliculi that help cells exchange materials. So that's the structure of an osteon. Okay, let's look at blood tissue now. So blood tissue is also highly specialized. It is located in the heart, in blood vessels, and its main function is to transport materials. What does it transport? Well, it transports nutrients, the gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, other waste materials like when proteins are deaminated or amino acids are deaminated before they enter the Krebs cycle, those NH2 groups are waste products. In fact, if they build up, um, it's toxic. So the blood's going to carry it to the kidney so the kidney can get rid of it. Um, the blood also carries hormones, which you learned about with endocrine glands. So in blood tissue, we have formed elements or cells, and we have matrix. 
I would like you to know the Latin terms for the formed elements or cells. So red blood cells are called erythrocytes. And they're those small pink ones without a nucleus. And the white blood cells are large and they don't look white at all, which is kind of funny. They stain very dark purple and they have weird nucleus shapes. We have lots of types of leukocytes. If you've had microbiology, you'll learn, you've already learned them. If not, you'll learn them in A and P2 or micro. Like this leukocyte looks very different from the other leukocyte that I circled. And they have different names. Um, one is a neutrophil and one's a monocyte. And then there are cell fragments called platelets, but the Latin term is thrombocyte. So that's a formed element. It's not a true cell, but if you call it a cell, I'd, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, so these cells live within plasma, which is the liquid matrix. So those are most of the specialized connective tissues. What's left are the cartilages. And there's three kinds of cartilages. The one on the left right here is called hyaline cartilage. And the one in the middle is elastic cartilage. It is stained so dark in between cells because of elastic fibers. That's what it has, is elastic fibers. And then this one on the right is called fibrocartilage. So we'll go through each of those so that you can tell the difference and you know the cell names. So in all cases, all cartilage types, the cells are called chondrocytes. So the chondrocytes are going to make the matrix in which they sit. Here's hyaline cartilage, here's elastic cartilage, and here's fibrocartilage. <clears throat> the two hyaline and fibro I have in very low magnification, but I put elastic cartilage at high magnification so that you could see the threads perhaps a little bit better. Of, and these threads that are running through are the elastic fibers. That's why it's called elastic cartilage. So where do you find these um, different types of cartilages? Well, let me tell you that hyaline cartilage is very strong, but it is more brittle. It has less pliability or ability to withstand compression than fibrocartilage does. Fibrocartilage can withstand the most compression. It has a little give in it. So hyaline cartilage forms the costal cartilages that attach your ribs to your sternum. Your trachea has rings of hyaline cartilage. Your voice box, technically called the larynx, is made of hyaline cartilage. And much of your skeleton when you were a fetus started out as hyaline cartilage. Some of that is retained at the ends of your bones where we form joints. Because although hyaline cartilage is strong but yet brittle, it's also very smooth. It's glassy smooth. So um, one bone articulating with another that has these hyaline cartilage ends enables the the bones to glide more smoothly with that tissue. Now elastic cartilage, since it has these elastic fibers, I guess it's a lot like hyaline, but it with the elastic fibers, it, it once compressed, it can recoil, right? So it will retain, it will help retain the shape of wherever it's located. So it's found in the pinna of your ear. Okay, the, the loose part that you can flip 
right? And it goes right back. And then another structure that's located near your larynx called the epiglottis. It helps dictate whether you swallow um, something or keep your airway open. It's, we'll look at it later. Fibrocartilage is super strong and it's found in the intervertebral discs between the vertebrae and it makes up the pubic symphysis in the pelvis where the two pubic bones meet. And then if you've ever heard of the meniscus in the knee, that's also made up of fibrocartilage. So here are the different functions I was talking about for cartilage. The main function overall of cartilage is just plain old support. That's what it does. It supports. Hyalin resists compression, but not nearly as much as fibrocartilage does. It provides a nice surface of gliding in joints as well. Hyalin does. And elastic cartilage allows some flexibility because of those elastic fibers. Okay, that is it for the study of tissues. Histology is done. Thank you very much.